This is Breakthroughs, a podcast from Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I'm Erin Spain, host of the show. It's estimated that more than half of people under the age of 50 around the world have a herpes virus infection, a lifelong condition with no cure. This infection can be much more serious than an occasional cold sore flare up. For some, it can cause blindness or life threatening encephalitis. It can also infect the nervous system, and there's increasing evidence that it contributes to dementia. Gregory Smith, professor of microbiology immunology at Feinberg, has been investigating a path to long-needed vaccine development for the virus. He recently published findings in the journal Nature that bring the possibility of a preventive vaccine a step closer. Welcome to the show, Dr. Smith. Thanks, Erin. Well, you have been studying this virus for quite some time. Tell me about the various herpes viruses that exist in humans, the prevalence of these viruses, and the work that's been taking place in your lab to really understand these viruses. There are herpes viruses throughout nature that infect basically every mammal that walks this planet. In humans, we have eight traditionally counting. The first one recognizes herpes simplex virus type 1, which we'll be talking about more today. But there's a type 2, there's Epstein-Barr virus, which has caused mononucleosis. There's cytomegalovirus, there's Kaposi sarcoma, and a few others. There's also an, sometimes a ninth that's referred to, which is actually a monkey herpes virus, but it can transmit from monkeys to humans and it often causes a lethal infection. You mentioned a couple of different viruses. And in this recent study published in Nature, there was the herpes simplex virus type 1 and type 2 that you talk about. Tell me specifically about those two. So these viruses are actually quite closely related. I've heard some of my colleagues have actually said that if they were discovered today, they probably wouldn't even get different numbers. Wow. <laughs> so they're very close. Yeah. But traditionally, the way with most people think about these things in terms of what they do is they often will just colloquially say that type 1 causes affections above the belt and type 2 ah. below the belt, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter is these viruses are perfectly capable of infecting either site within our body. So you often think of type 1 causing cold sores around the mouth and type 2 with genital infections and sexually transmitted infection. But really, you can get type 2 you know, in the face and mucosal mm -hmm. layers of the mouth in the mouth and type one can get into the genitals. And in fact, in developed countries such as ours, HSV type one is more prevalent in the neurons that innervate the genitals and type two is. Tell me about the typical way that the virus infects and moves through the body. It starts off much like any other respiratory viral pathogen. So like a common cold virus or influenza, you get exposed to it and it's going to start replicating in your mucosal uh, linings, typically in your mouth and your nose, could also do your eyes, anywhere that's exposed. And so the, in those tissues, you know, the barrier, the cells that are exposed to the environment are typically an epithelial barrier cell lining, uh, mucosal epithelial cells. And, and the virus is very tuned to entering these cells and replicating and producing much more virus. And as it does that, you know, if it's a common cold, you're going to start sneezing and wheezing and coughing and the virus that's being produced will start releasing back out into your mucus. And basically that's what's happening currently with the pandemic and coronaviruses as well. With herpes, there's something else going on. It can, all of that is true here too, but the important addition is that the virus can also transmit from those mucosal epithelial cells to deeper tissues and specifically to the nerve endings that innervate those tissues. So if you get punched in the face or in your lip and you feel that hit, right? That's because there's a sensory neuron or a population of sensory neurons coming from a region of your peripheral nervous system called the trigeminal ganglion, which is a ball of neuronal tissue below your brain. It's not part of your brain. It's part of the peripheral nervous system, not the central nervous system. But nevertheless, they have their nerve fibers protruding out to you different parts of your face, including your lips. When you feel that, it's because there is a firing and action potential in that neuron that's conveying that sensory input all the way through those neurons of the trigeminal ganglia and passing it onto the brainstem in the brain. Ultimately, you consciously recognize you got hit and you go, ow, okay? But the virus is actually using those nerves to actually physically move as opposed to an electrical impulse, it's using them to physically move within those nerve fibers. And we'll get to that trigeminal ganglia that mm -hmm. I just described. Yeah. And that's where it typically resides in us for the rest of our lives. Some people may be surprised to hear that the herpes virus can cause damage to the nervous system. Explain that damage to me. So in most cases, we presume that there isn't damage occurring. In fact, most people live with this virus may not even be aware that they're living with it, even though they might be shedding it, infecting other people. So for the most part, it doesn't seem like it causes much damage. So for anybody out there who gets cold sores, they shouldn't be 
worry that the sky is falling and bad things are going to happen to them. But there are cases where you do get clear damage. And the most obvious one we talk about is herpes simplex encephalitis. That's, that's probably about one in 200 to 300,000 people who are infected. It's a really low number, but of course, it's very devastating when it does happen. So herpes simplex encephalitis is a disease, not only the virus killing cells of the brain, but also of your immune system doing destruction, trying to get rid of the virus. The really interesting thing here is that there was this kind of dogma in the field for a long time that the typical route of infection into the trigeminal ganglia and then the reactivation later in life that will bring it back out to your lip again and maybe cause a cold sore, that that's the norm. And then once in a while, bad things happen like encephalitis. But we're realizing it's not so black and white anymore. There is a range of disease that can manifest. And in fact, when people have done studies of cadavers that people have died in car accidents or other things and looked at neural tissue from them, they found herpes simplex DNA, not just in the trigeminal ganglia, but in the brain stems and often in the brains of patients that didn't die because of herpes, died to something else. So the virus is going into lots of different kinds of neural tissue, much more than the dogma would have you believe. And in one thing we should be thinking about is, well, what's the consequence of that? And what we're learning is that there might be some significant consequences. And there has been the suggestion that there could be associations with herpes virus infections of the nervous system. And instead of a full-blown encephalitis that could kill you, more subtle types of CNS disease that might lead to things like dementia or maybe even Alzheimer's disease. So this may not be the causative agent of those things, but it may be a contributing factor to these things. I want you to explain to me the main findings in this paper that you recently published in Nature. This was a really important paper. Tell me about that. The study basically was getting at that central question. How does the virus invade our nervous system? There are a number of viruses that can infect the nervous system, but they are probably the minority viruses of human viruses that cause disease. Most of our human viruses infect the respiratory tract or the digestive tract. Very few get into the nervous system, but there's a number do. Classic ones are polio, which caused poliomyelitis, particularly in the 50s in the United States. States. And then there's rabies is another classic one. You get bit by a rabid animal, it's going to go right into your nervous system. Herpes is a little different. So herpes is what I would like to refer to as a proficient neuroinvader. Unlike those other viruses, it's going to get into your nervous system probably every single time that you get exposed. People could argue that rabies will do the same thing. It's true, but rabies is dependent on an animal to bite you and actually damage your tissue to get the virus into your nerves. Herpes doesn't even need that. So it's very good at being neuroinvasive. And the mechanisms by which it can do that, no other virus is known to be able to get into our nervous system like herpes can so subtly and easily. And so we really want to understand that molecular mechanism that underlies that phenotype to get a better grasp, not only how the virus is able to do that, but how we can ultimately use that information to stop it, or maybe even use that information to do other kinds of important research development, such as making new gene therapy vectors. Most viruses, not all, but most viruses use the microtubule cytoskeletal tracts to get to where they need to go to ultimately replicate within that cell. And for some viruses like herpes, that destination is the nucleus of the cell. Now, the problem is, is that microtubules don't extend off the nucleus proper. They extend off another structure in the cell, something called a microtubule organizing center. And the most common form of that is called the centrosome. If a virus is going to ride along a track, a microtubule track, and do it so that's going inward bound the whole time, doing a marathon run, so to speak, it's going to end up getting to the end of the microtubules, which are at the centrosome. And then it's going to be kind of blocked from going any further. That's the end of the road. And it's also kind of an interesting end of the road because the cell, for whatever reason, has evolved to have a lot of protein turnover, a lot of degradation occur at that side of the cell. So in a sense, the virus is running right into the trash can of the cell, which is not a good thing you would think for a virus to evolve to do. So most viruses don't do that because probably because there's an inherent danger in doing that for the virus. So most viruses, what they do is they get a microtubule track and they just kind of bounce around. They'll go a little bit that way. They'll go a little bit this way. And basically what they're ultimately doing is facilitating their diffusion within the viscous environment of the cell. And given enough time, they'll get to wherever they need to go just by chance. Okay, so mm -hmm. you could call that a dumb <laughs> virus. So herpes is on the marathon run. And so when it gets there, it's now in trouble because it can't just meander away from it. It's dedicated to going one direction. And so it's going to get locked there. And so what we realize is there must be a second step that the viruses have evolved that once they get to the centrosome, that they must be able to leave that centrosome and somehow then go to the nucleus, their final destination. And so the paper starts with this question of how does that happen? And there's been a hypothesis in the field that, well, once you get to the centrosome, you would just have to use a different motor, like a different train engine that's moving on these microtubule tracks, motor that belongs to the cell that the virus would then use to go to where it needs to go. It presumably would have to use a molecular motor called kinesin. 
And so we looked for that. We ultimately did find that the viruses were hijacking the kinesin motor and using it to go from the sensorosome to the nucleus. So it all kind of clicked into place. But then there was, we got a big surprise as we continued to do this work that we, it was completely unexpected to us, I think to anybody. And that surprise was that when it does use that kinesin, the kinesin that's using is not from the cell that it's currently infecting. It turns out it's from a cell that it infected beforehand from a previous round of infection. A more specific example is that the virus, when it's first replicating in our mucosal epithelia, those exposed tissues in a respiratory tract, it's actually picking up kinesins in those epithelial cells. I had a colleague once tell me, oh, so herpes viruses are taking kinesins and putting it in their backpack and they're going to pull it out later and saving it for later. And that's, I think, I think that's a great analogy. So now here's the new scenario. The virus is doing the marathon run down a nerve fiber on its way to the trigeminal ganglia. Eight hours later, it gets to the centrosome and then it reaches into its backpack and it pulls out that kinesin that it, that it stole from the epithelial cell long ago. And now it uses that specifically to go from the centrosome to the nucleus. And so not only was this explaining an aspect of how these viruses so efficiently get into our nervous system, but it was the first demonstration in all of virology that I'm aware of, and I've talked to a lot of people about this, where a virus grabs a cellular protein and makes it part of the viral particle so that that protein now becomes a proviral, that is something that supports infection, a proviral component of the viral particle for subsequent rounds of infection. Since that had never been seen before, we wanted to come up with a name for this process and we referred to it as assimilation. So basically the kinesin is being assimilated by the virus. And for any Star Trek nerds out there, I will admit that part of the reason that name came up was thinking of the captain of the Enterprise that gets captured by the Borg and he's assimilated <laughs> by the Borg and becomes one of them is now fighting on the, with the Borg yeah. instead of with, a, yeah. with the Enterprise. And, and that's kind of what, how we think of what's happening here with kinesin. It's so interesting. And you said that you've been talking to colleagues about this finding and they're all just as surprised as you are. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Everybody's very surprised by this just because there was no precedent. There was a precedent that viruses capture cellular proteins into their viral particles that release from cells. That had been seen for quite a while. And in some cases, those viral proteins can actually be antiviral. So there's these classic group of proteins called apobex. They're very well studied in the, in the field of HIV, where they actually can hinder the ability of the virus to infect a cell. So they kind of are thought of torpedoes that go, as the viruses are relieving the cell, they go in and they, they plant this little bomb into the virion so that when the virions try to infect another cell, they can't do it anymore. They get disrupted by it. So it's a clever antiviral mechanism of the cell. There are also lots of other proteins that are known to be put into viral particles just in general, but for to no apparent reason. That maybe they're just kind of gobbled up by random chance. But this is an example where evolutionarily the virus has adapted to take a protein and use it later on. And that's it's the first time. Well, how does this open doors to a possible vaccine? We now have a way to make a new type of live attenuated vaccine by removing the ability of the virus to invade the nervous system. You've now attenuated its ability to not only be neuroinvasive, but to cause lifelong latent infections and to cause most of the diseases that can happen, including cold sores and encephalitis. So now you have a virus that you can put theory into the mucosa. I sometimes imagine it's just like having a chapstick formulation. You just rub it on your lip, no needle involved, right? No adjuvant. You just let the virus do its thing. But Herpes has evolved to run and hide in your nervous system and get you for life. These particular attenuated viruses can't do that if you mutate what we've learned the virus is doing. The immune system sees this very robust infection in your mucosa, in your respiratory tissue, and it goes after a full force saying, oh my gosh, we got to do something here. And after it clears it, because it's going to win because the virus can't hide anymore, it's going to have the most adapted ready to go immune response possible when you get exposed to the real thing later in your life. And so we think this is going to be the key discovery that's going to allow for vaccines to be successful for the first time. What's the next step? What happens now? You've published this paper. You have this discovery. When could we possibly see vaccine trials based on these findings? So we're working effortlessly to get this technology forward. And outside of my academic lab, in collaboration with Northwestern, a startup company was formed. It's called Theorius Incorporated. So the company is working to make this vaccines a reality. And what's kind of interesting about this is these fundamental properties of how these herpes viruses get into the nervous system are not unique to herpes simplex virus type 1 or type 2. It's fundamental to all the neuroinvasive herpes viruses 
whether it be those, whether it be chickenpox virus, varicella zoster virus, whether it be a veterinary pathogen of your cat at home or the cattle from which we get the beef from for the food industry, all of these have neuroinvasive herpes viruses that are causing severe disease in, the, in those animals. And all of those viruses can be designed to become live attaining viruses that can invade the nervous system using technology that we've been able to develop. So we're hoping to make a whole bunch of vaccines here based on this basic idea and furthermore, demonstrate feasibility between all of them. So if we show that a pig vaccine works the way we says it does, and we then we show a cow one that does, that just further reinforces that this is a good, solid approach for going after human ones. But we're not waiting. We're going after the human ones right away, too, all in parallel. What about folks who already have the virus? So this is a question that I get a lot. You know, I often will get emails from individuals, too, asking about this uh, that are not outside of the scientific community. The idea of having vaccines that are prophylactic, which is what we ultimately want to be able to develop, ones that will prevent you from getting infected. So these would be ones given probably as an adolescent vaccine. These same vaccines could be used as therapeutics. Just like right now, we have therapeutic vaccines for varicella zoster virus and shingles, right? So the hope would be that a person who has, let's say, high recurrence HSV infections is suffering from this more so than the average person, that you could give them the vaccine as a way to boost up their immunity and help suppress their infection. So it's a treatment. It's not a cure, but it could make a world of difference. Is there anything else you want to add or that you just want to sum up for us today? You know, studying herpes simplex viruses, I've been doing this now for 20 years in Northwestern and five years before that at Princeton as a postdoc. It's been a real eye-opener. You really get a sense of what pathogens are able to accomplish. And they're just absolutely fascinating. If I could do it all over again, I'd probably just do the exact same thing that I did. Because every time we discover something the virus is doing, it just blows our minds. And, and this last publication was probably one of the more exciting things that we've ever discovered. But it's just one in many of these viruses just teaching us about biology. And it's just an exciting thing to be studying. Thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe to Breakthroughs on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to shows. And if you are a medical professional, you can claim CME credit just for listening to this episode. Go to our website, feinberg.northwestern.edu, and search Breakthroughs CME. 